on this episode of The Brook. Do you remember an incident? This would have been like 85. It's not up there because I was debating whether I should even talk about it. But uh, In the uh, sanctuary, he changed all the hymnal boards to 666. Oh. Every time they robbed a pizza, they made everybody in the store strip. They didn't say that Dave stole it. Well, no, they said Dave Regal just stole my place. <laughs> <right there>, yeah. <laughs> so right new right where it so, fell. Do you remember this incident? Hell yeah. Do you really? And about midnight, they got, they called Frank, who was the corporal for the shift. And they said, over in Latchmere, we've got skinny dippers in the pool. Would you do it again? Oh, I would, in a heartbeat. Yeah. It was the best job I ever had. They're going along, and all of a sudden you hear this, uh, 1291 County, 1291 County, officer down, 2600 block of Wall Street. Hmm. I still get emotional about this. Um, next thing the county goes, county to all cars, officer down, 2600 block of Walnut. All right, so here today with Ray McGarrow. It's crazy that you're sitting in this room today. So he's been a police officer for 25 years. He ran with fire and EMS for as long, if not longer. But uh, Dave and I know Ray from you know, 1984 when I moved to Edgemont, actually, on the edge of Pembroke. Uh, that's all we'd hear. He was the officer that would, uh, that we, you know, if we did something wrong, they were like, Ray McGarrow's going to get you. So, uh, <laughs> so he was infamous. He was the guy, you know, at first we were terrified of him. But after, you know, we got to talking to him, he embodied the spirit of community-oriented policing at that time. And I don't even know if that was a thing back then. But, Ray, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. So when did you start Pembroke? I started in July, it was July 10th, 1979. 1979. Wow, so you were there for a while. You already knew Pembroke well. Uh, yeah, I was familiar with it because I had started out at Susquehanna Township at Progress Fire Company okay. at 16. So you know, we had a lot of mutual aid calls. So I kind of got yeah. to learn Pembroke. And Pembroke, there's no rhyme or reason to Pembroke. The streets are just right. Yeah, they picked it through it, and wherever it landed, that's where the streets are. It's crazy. Well, so where did you grow up at? I grew up in Susquehanna Township. Where at? Right off of Progress Avenue, out there. There's two churches on Progress Avenue before you get down over the hill to 7-Eleven by the high school. And I lived one block back from those churches on Belvedere Road. Um, so what what school did you go to then? What, Susquehanna Township High School. Oh, you went to Susquehanna Township? Yeah, I okay. can see it from my house. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Really? Back there? Okay. Um, what is that? Elmerton Avenue back there? Yeah, I was up on the hill <clears throat> when you come down over. Oh, okay. And I, that's I, where I, I went to high school, Susquehanna. Well, yeah, that's where Dave and I met. Um, when I moved to Edgemont, we ended up meeting in gym class, which is a funny story. But um, so you you went to Susquehanna High School, middle school also, or and I was I started in Progress for the first three years, Progress Elementary. In my fourth grade year, they opened Sarah Lindemuth, so I was the first class in Sarah Lindemuth as a fourth grader. Is that right? Yeah. Huh. And I cried. I didn't want to go over there. Is that right? <laughs> no, I love Progress. So when you, um, I mean, as a child then, when you're going to, where'd you hang out? I mean, because as far as I know, Pembroke was the only place where there was, uh, you know, like game rooms and stuff like that. Well, there was a neighborhood six, and that's what I called us. And we had six sets of parents because we all hung out. We were all within, all like one street or one block from each other. And some one night we'd be at Phil's house, one night we'd be at Tony's, one night we'd be at mine, you know. And all the moms looked out for us and uh, made food for us and... Tony's mom put a pool in, uh, and she decided that since Wedgwood didn't want to let them join, she said, oh, you guys come here, and all you have to do is help Tony clean the pool. Hmm. So it, it started off that way, you know, as our young young days, but we were inseparable. We did everything together. We, and Phil was really into chemistry and science. Hmm. He won the science fair at McDevitt every year. Hmm. And uh, You we, still talk to them? Do, well, Phil passed away. He got a, a nervous, a nerve disease and it, it killed him he was actually oh. a forensic pathologist for the state police is that right that. really yeah. wow can i keep in touch with some of the other guys uh rick i haven't seen for a long time he was out on a uh oil rigger out in the ocean gemologist or something but we haven't seen him for a long time but the rest oh. of the guys i keep in touch with so at high school did you play any sports or anything like that football baseball i was in the band i absolutely love band and uh weightlifting club careers and health of course I was a guard and a defensive end. I was 150 pounds and I was a guard. Oh, was that right? Yeah, yeah. and the, yeah. the biggest guy on our line was 180, it was Bob Herman. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah. we, we were called the, the Mini Max, I think they called us. And we were undefeated and then we got that flood in 75 and Cumberland Valley and I and I, Susquehanna were both 4-0 and they made us move it 
to the end of the season. Oh. And we were like 9-0, and and we lost to Cumberland Valley. Oh, I was geez. very upset. Uh, what year did you graduate? 76, 1976. Oh, okay, 76. That was the uh, bicentennial. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So you get out of high school. What What do you... I mean, at that point, I mean, what are you thinking of doing for a future? Well, I wanted to be a paramedic. That was my goal all my life from the time I first saw Emergency on television, ah, believe it or not. Yeah, and Adam-12 was a, another influence back then, which I'm still watching both of them every night till midnight yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the closest paramedic program was Chicago when I graduated. Really? Yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't want to move to uh, Chicago or out to Los Angeles, so... I said, well, option two is police officer. So that's what I did. I went to Hack, got my associates in uh, police administration, and then I went to Penn State and got my uh, bachelor's degree in sociology with an emphasis in criminal justice. So you went straight from high school into college, Jim, with, I mean, thinking you're probably eventually going to do law enforcement. Yeah. Huh. And uh, I actually, I got hired in Pembroke <clears throat> in 79, and I was in my halfway through my second year of Penn State. So I had to skip a semester and because the dates didn't quite match for the academy and the semester. So I missed January's, uh, I missed two semesters. I missed the spring semester and then uh, the summer semester because I was in the academy. Oh, okay. And then the Pembroke left me go back that fall to get my degree. Oh, did they really? Yeah, yeah. they left me off and, and uh, had someone cover my shifts so I could go back to class two nights a week. Would they pay for it at that point, or I paid for my well, yeah. I paid for my schooling. But uh, what about probably, the academy? Did they send you through the? Academy? Oh yeah, they they, Did they? they had, <clears throat> state paid for the academy, and Pembroke had to pay me my salary. And they they gave us uniforms, they gave us meal allowances. Oh wow, okay, yours. yeah. Oh nice. So back then, was there a consortium type testing thing like they have now, or yeah, we, we I, but it was an individual department, not like a like a group thing where you go in and then they have ten departments they can choose you from. Okay. Uh, it was just, I tested for Pembroke. I finished second. I finished, for, uh, Minnie Myers was first. And I believe today she's either the chief of Mechanicsburg or just may have retired. Is that right, really? But they hired her over me, or hired me over her, and I'm not 100% sure why. I got the job and uh, asked me how much my salary was when I started. A police salary back in, in 79, you said? Yep. 79. Um, I mean, I would say, what, 10? Real close, ninety six fifty. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's crazy. I mean, yeah. I mean, we had full yeah. benefits and stuff, but ninety six nine thousand six hundred fifty dollars a year between patrol work and then I was CI for a little bit, criminal investigation, and then I was uh, that was extra in, in addition to the patrol shifts. Okay, I take one patrol shift and give me. One shift a week for CI. Oh, nice. Yeah. Filling in for a little bit. Yeah, because they didn't have a detective, right? No, well, no, we just started that in, in the mid, hmm. mid-80s, mid but uh, it worked out pretty well. But I was acting chief for 20 months, and that was extra duties and extra reports, and you know how that goes. Yeah. So you start there in 79. Uh, who was your, did you have an FTO, or was it pretty much just get out there and, and do this thing? Back then, it's not like it is now. You have to go to the academy first. When I started, you could go work six up to six months before they sent you. The Is academy. that right, really? So I did. Oh wow! I didn't go to the academy until January. So back then, I mean, you get your gear, you get your gun, your badge, and you know, it's get out there and, and do it. Gun badge, nightstick, and car keys, and handcuffs. Here you go. <laughs> and no, no, they did. They had we had three months of ride along training. Don't get me wrong. Okay. But, yeah. Um, I learned from Bill Imschweiler and Mike Reynolds, and Mike was acting chief then, and then they moved Bill up into that slot when Mike went over to Hampton. And then something happened. They got unhappy with the department, and they moved me up. And they asked me if I wanted to be acting chief or they were going to go outside. So I said, rather than disturb the department, I would do it. Yeah. So when did you take over as acting chief? I think it was somewhere around 83 or 84. Oh, okay. It was so almost it was, two years in that job. So you weren't there? Wow. Okay. Yeah, no. They, that, see, it was, it was kind of a design thing where they wanted to kind of like put me over the guys that trained me, and that didn't sit real well. Yeah, I can imagine. But we had a little... We had private meetings, you know, without everybody else. And I explained to the guys, we're going to do this democratically. And it was only fair because those guys trained me. So we had four guys. It was me and Bill Anschwiller, Mike Reynolds, and Dave Heaster. Dave started three months after I did. And then uh, we voted collectively on everything pretty much. Huh. But, I mean, how long were those guys in policing when this happened? Oh, probably... 
five, 10 years. So I know the saying is you're a rookie until at least five years. Yeah. So, I mean, technically you were a rookie at that point. Yeah, they were throwing me to the wolves. <laughs> but we, we, made, we made it through there. I mean, I had some great guys to work with. They were absolutely phenomenal people to work with. Well, that's insane though. I mean, they put you uh, in charge of the veterans. Yeah. And, and what what do you think made that decision? I mean, was that the was that the, the, the borough council that made that decision? Or? Yes, it was borough council, and it had something to do with back then. Um, they, the political influence was big, you know, and yeah. the borough well, council yeah, people still is right. Yeah, they came from all walks of life. They were <clears throat> electricians, carpenters, whatever, you know, and they they wanted to be like, well, I'm we're in charge of the police department, and they just did it in my opinion, just to, to mess with us. Yeah, okay. They wanted to create a rift in the department. And uh, I'm not sure why, but yeah, <clears throat> we uh, we dealt with it. You know, we lived with it. I mean, we you know, we had councilmen, that, like when we wanted to go to blue uniforms, we were in gray, like Pennsylvania State Police. Yeah. And the one council said, we don't have blue uniforms on the railroad. Well, Ben, that was 1960, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, but so, yeah. Things like that, you know. Right, yeah. So we, 20 I'm, months you were acting chief there. Yes, I making was. Making decisions, going to the borough council meetings, yes. speaking on the department. And they wanted me to work daylight. And I came back to borough council and I met with them privately as a group. And I said, I don't want to work daylight five days a week and go home Saturday and Sunday because I'm not accessible. If I'm going to be chief of this department, then I want the people to be able to get to me. So I'm going to work my three days a week, three to 11, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I'm here. Hmm. Thursday and Friday, I'm probably going to be here anyway during the day doing speed enforcement or something. And Saturday and Sunday daylight so people can access me. Hmm. They're off on the weekends, they can come see me. And they like that idea, so that's what I did. So were you on patrol? Yeah. Also, you were patrol chief. Patrol chief. Yeah, you were out there. Huh? Five shifts a week, at least. How many guys did you have on duty typically back then? Uh, we had, well, one one man a shift for okay. the most part. Okay. Saturday nights, we put two out because we had the St. Margaret Mary's church dance and the kids got yeah. a little rowdy after that right which i'm, well, sure, I'm mean, sure you guys yeah, that's that. a, yeah, we know about saint margaret mary's um there's some epic fights got that we're aware there. of <laughs> yeah yeah legendary fights i mean you yeah, know scotty red cross that's <laughs> when he he face palmed me at the edge of the valley yeah. and he pushed me down the hill and oh. backwards tumble down the hill. <laughs> well, the one, I mean, that, that sticks out to me, I can't remember his name, the karate guy, who went up there and got beat up by a boxer. Um, remember St. Margaret Man? Yeah, you remember that story? Uh, you don't remember that guy? Karate guy, Clyde Armstrong, killing karate No, guy, we won't mention any names, but he was actually, he was in the Olympics for, for Kung Fu. Um... You didn't know that? You got know, beat up by a boxer. He got beat up by a boxer know, from Edgemont. Yeah. Tough kids in Susquehanna Township. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, that that's like right on the border of Edgemont and Pembroke. So it was kind of a combination of the two of them that there came up there. There's always a bit of a, uh, I don't know what you want, but like some kind of conflict going on between Pembroke <clears throat> and, and Edgemont. Yeah, Edgemont's that's, a strange place. Um, there was always a... Electricity in the air yeah. when the carnival would come to right. St. Mags. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. There's going to be a rumble between Pembroke and Hedgemont. <laughs> it usually yeah. didn't happen. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, that's all I got to figure out. Uh, I'll find out who, who that was. I mean, maybe that was a Pembroke. Edgemont fight, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, definitely needed extra patrol units for that night. So who was your backup then? Pax Tang was our. Well, I shouldn't say that. Pax Tang and Susquehanna Township. Okay, Susquehanna. Occasionally the city. Oh, uh, okay. Something big, um, you know, the city was coming too, but uh, most of the time it was Pax Tang. Most of the time it was my partner in recruit school, Dave Buckwash. So Dave Buckwash, is that his name? Buckwash? Yeah, Buckwash. So he was Pax Tang? Yeah, and he also was part time in Pembroke. Oh. Um, Jack Harlacker was Dairy Township, part time in Pembroke. We had we had a great group of part timers. We had like four from the Capitol Police Department. Okay, and all these guys were full time somewhere else, but they filled in. Yeah, and then I worked at Capitol Campus part time. Okay, uh, the police department down there. So how many full time positions did Pembroke have in the eighties? There was four full time positions, and later it went to five where they added an, an extra chief, or added the chief as a position separately, and then he became the borough manager. Uh, okay, so he was off the road. What do they have now? Uh, police chief, borough manager. But there's still five full time, or I don't know how many. I think they have five or six full time now. Uh -huh. We were four full time and uh, five part time, so we had nine people. Hmm. And what's the first major case you had to work in Pembroke? You can remember. I remember when I was pretty new. We had a, a man barricade himself in a house down there, 29th and Camby Street. It was actually the first alley back there by Ray Chevron, 
and he was shooting out the window with a shotgun. So we're, they had pictures of us. We had, I still have the newspaper article of us hiding behind the car. We're down, crouched down behind the car. And the, the newspaper article said, who are these men in these dark blue uniforms? And what are they doing? <laughs> and it was our resident, uh, I don't want to say this politely. Yeah. That he guy. A, he was our yeah. resident guy that liked to drink a lot. Right, right, right. And he got off the wall drunk and got off the wall upset. And mm. he just started, you know shooting out the window and threatening everybody. And we, we finally talked him out of it. I mean, have you ever had to call QRT out? I don't know what Dolphin County calls their SWAT team. We had to call the bomb squad one night. We had a, uh, down there on 2600 block of Pembroke Avenue, right behind Commonwealth Bank, Forte Music had moved into a little studio there. Mm. And that, before they moved over to 27th Street, and then they moved out to Lower Paxton there on Mountain Road. But we had a, a suspicious briefcase that appeared in their waiting room where the students came in and Don was very upset about it. So we finally decided to check it out and rather safe than sorry, we called the bomb squad. So they came out and they removed it and it, it wasn't anything. It was just somebody left their briefcase there, but yeah, um, that was, that was pretty wild that night. We were there for a few hours and then we had the arsonist running around Pembroke. Uh, he was setting, set the barn on fire behind the hardware store. He said he was going around all over the place and, setting fires. Oh, what year was that? Um, that was about not mid 80s somewhere. Mid-80s, yeah. yeah, I mean Wayne had that hardware store down there, Colonial Hardware and it was incredible. Anything you needed, you could go in there and get. Hmm. And if he didn't have it, he'd get it for you. I don't think everyone went in there. He had a big barn out behind Dolphin Deposit was over here and then Bank Street went up and then it was the hardware store with a big barn and this clown set the barn on fire. Oh jeez. So we were out all night on that one until wee hours of the morning and uh you know, catch the guy? Yeah, they finally got him. And then it turned into the church arsonist. Mm-hmm. That was a big thing. He left us a message. One day we were running speed detail. And I went back to the office to get something. I went up Walnut Street and I saw the, it was Grace, Method, Grace United Methodist on the corner there. And they had those yeah. red doors. Yeah. And I watched the door go closed as I came up to the red light. And it was like nine o'clock at night. I said, there's nobody in that church. So we surrounded the church. We went in there with two dogs mm-hmm. and searched the building. And we couldn't find anybody. We got into one classroom downstairs. And he goes, you fools. You missed me again. Really? Better luck next time. He left us a note in the chalkboard. Oh, boy. Brazen. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, That's not the same guy that was burning down the barns. No, not the same. A different guy. <clears throat> hmm. And then we had, uh, we, they finally got him. They tracked that guy with the churches. Um, he did a church somewhere. Or he was going to do it. I guess it wasn't St. Margaret Mary's because I had him at St. Margaret Mary's. And it was like three o'clock in the afternoon and the church called, they were all upset. So we were a shift change. So I went flying down there and we got in here in, in the uh, sanctuary, he changed all the hymnal boards to 666. Oh, jeez. And then he, he tore a page out of the book and it had a, a, like a storybook about Jesus and the children. It said about how Jesus loves me and stuff. And he tore it out and he wrote, it said Jesus on this page. And then over here where it says loves me, he goes, he wrote not me. Oh. And it stuck it on the piano. Interesting. And uh, not long after that, they tracked him from a fire down through the woods and uh, came up in Harris Lodge Apartments there on Progress Avenue. And they oh. tracked him right to his back door. Do you remember when they were going around robbing the pizza huts? No. And they were the strip bandits? No. Every time they robbed a pizza hut, they made everybody in the store strip, put them outside in the freezer. Really? Yeah, I was working the night they did the one there on, or on Mullen Street right there at 34th Street. And somebody went in there and there was nobody there. It was like abandoned. And I guess they went outside and they heard people beating on the doors and they called. And they were all in there with no clothes oh, on. Oh, jeez. It was freezer. a pizza hut. Yeah, a pizza hut. That pizza hut down there. I do vaguely remember hearing something like that. Yeah, they, they were doing all the pizza huts. And I, I was like, it just, that, that was the one we really wanted to get. I don't know if they ever got them or not. Huh. Yeah, about what period was that? In the 80s. Oh, early okay. 80s. Early 80s. Okay. So we were talking on the break about an incident of a motorcycle being stolen, and you were able to locate it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was, it was like a, I came to work at like 3 o'clock and started my shift off on the wrong foot with motorcycle theft report, right? It's like, you know, it's going to be a, a long day when you start stuff like that. So I, when I took the report from Robin Haverstein, he lived up on Pembroke Avenue there up above the pharmacy, and I started thinking about it a little bit, and I said, well, I know where to start to look because there's a good possibility it might be there. So I went up the street and not even a block from his house. It was in the garage out back and I heard him in there talking. So 
the door was open, so I just walked in and say hi, and there's this Kawasaki motorcycle being stripped that belonged to Robin Aberstein. <laughs> I was like, hey! And they're like, oh, it's McGarrow. I'm like, yep. <laughs> where'd, where'd we get this guy? Put it back together now. So yeah. what they did then? They put it back I made it put it back together, and, and uh, I don't remember the what we all did with that. I think that one went to juvenile probation. Mm. Wow. Well, that's a perfect place for me to jump in here. Because I've been sitting on a story all week long, and it's very important that I get it out there. And I'm going to speak to which camera. I'm not sure which one's getting me. That one there's getting you. But I'm going to name drop somebody. Russell East. Russell, it's been 30 years, but I still have to apologize sincerely for stealing your bicycle. Mm, but that's, I, right. that's right. When I was younger, I, I kind of had a little issue with stealing bicycles and uh, I had a refrigerator box in the basement and I would take bicycles and a lot of the time to be honest I was stealing them mainly from the guy that was stealing them and uh, so in my in my mind that made it okay but I would take the bike strip it down put all the junk parts in the refrigerator box take the, take the best parts put them on my bicycle but uh, at some point, Russell, he's this kid we knew. He lived in the same apartment house in Copper. And uh, 27th and Bow Street. He had a, uh, he had bought a GT Dyna, which was the hottest thing at the time. And he had it, and it would always sit outside of his apartment. And I wanted that bike so bad. One day, I wanted it so bad, I just was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to like, like pull the handle on the, on the gambling machine. You know, I'm gonna take this. They're either watching me or they're not, but they were watching me. So I'd get his bike, ride it back to my place on Clover and Bose, take it in the garage, strip it down, getting ready to call somebody to come get the frame. I had a I had a I had it all worked out. Before I got to make the phone call, I hear this shifter. I heard, you know, an engine pull up and a shifter. And around comes the, around the door, and they had to swing open doors. Around the door comes Ray, and he looks in and he says, "Jesus, Dave, you got that bicycle stripped already." <laughs> now we're now I know where all the bicycles are going. <laughs> but um, and you know, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was busted. And Ray said, "Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna go in the house. You're gonna tell your dad that you got arrested for stealing a bicycle." And you're going to load that bicycle parts in your dad's car and you're going to come up to my office if you're not there in 30 minutes. It's going to be hell to pay. No, no. Really you start really Hey, on. hey! I beg Ray, I was like, can't you just take me to jail, please? You know, I'm going to go to jail and, <laughs> and tell, tell my dad. dad. Yeah. You know, and Ray said, no, that's not how it's going to work. You're going to go tell your dad. So I had to humble myself and go in there and talk to my dad about this and own up to it and... We loaded the stuff in the car and went up to Ray's office and Ray had a little, as I recall, I think it might have been an ammo case, toolbox or something. He gave me a pliers and an adjustable wrench. And he made me put the bicycle back together and tune every last little nut and bolt. He said, I want that to be like a brand new bike when you're done. And the whole time I worked on that, Ray was talking to me about criminals in prison and what it looks like in prison. And the things that you would have to fear in prison. And I think he might have talked to me about my disposition. He knew I was no tough guy, you know, but uh, Ray was able to really get inside of my head about, about where I was headed. He talked to me about being 17 years old, that I could be tried as an adult. Um, I had three months to go till I was an adult. You know, I don't remember every word of that conversation, Ray, but my whole life ever since. You know, you can go on the PA dockets and search my name, and there's nothing there. I've, I've stayed out of trouble ever since that day. That was the last bicycle I ever stole, last anything I ever stole. And uh, I want to thank you personally from the bottom of my heart because you were the guy that got through to me, and a lot of people really did try to get through to me, and... You were the one. Well, you know, I, and back then in the 80s, I had, I called them my Pembroke kids. 
And yeah, it was the Rumbergers, the, the Nyharts, Haversteins, Jimmy Clark, you. I guess you for a little bit. Yeah, every once and, in a while. Curfew, that, typically. You know, there, there was a, a Ross Hine and his sister Taryn. And, you know, there was just a bunch of kids. And it's funny because a lot of them said, oh, he's so hard. He's so rough. He And my bark was really bad. You know what I mean? I used to tear into them sometimes, like loitering at 7-Eleven or something. I'd read them the riot act. But basically what I was trying to do was keep them out of trouble. Right. You yeah. know, and it's really funny because... I've been gone from Pembroke now for 25, 30 years. And uh, the kids that I had then, you know, the Beavers and, and uh, Ricky Robinson and Poke. Yeah. Uh, all that, that whole gang. Almost yeah. everybody I talk to on Facebook or I see them and we're friends today. And now a lot of them have come to me over the years and they said, you know, Ray, we thought you were such a hard ass and you were such a, a rotten police officer and you were so terrible to us. But... All you're trying to do is keep us out of trouble. Yeah, exactly. And I, I was. I mean, I, I dearly loved every one of them. I just couldn't tell them that because I wanted them to fear the bark. Right. Yeah. 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 The bicycle incident. So <coughs> you stole the bike from Russell East, mm -hmm. and some, and they saw you do it. Yeah, it was broad daylight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you wasn't very smart. No secret scrolls there. That's one of the there. things Ray would say. You're not a very smart criminal, man. So they called the cops. Russell East did. He's like, oh, uh, well, somebody from there called the cops. I don't know if Russell saw me do it or his mom. Oh, or, so somebody or, called. Well, and they didn't say that Dave stole. They oh no, they said Dave Regal just stole my bicycle. <laughs> yeah. So Ray knew right where to so, go. So yeah. where, where? So you went through it. Do you remember this incident? Oh yeah. Do you really? Yeah. And. Uh, I got to interject something here because you guys are going to get a real kick out of this. When I went to get Mrs. East, you know, go in and tell her, right? I, it's the first time I ever met the lady. And they live right there in the apartments where Easter did. And uh, I go in and I ring the doorbell or rap on the door and she answers the door. And I come in and I said, we started talking. And I said, well, Mrs. East, I don't know. She goes, excuse me. And she she was uh, like really high up in the post office with uh, uh, human relations and stuff. Yeah. And she was a really funny lady. But she, she looked at me and she goes, it's Ms. East. Oh, damn. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, I felt like the Tommy Hawk went right over my head there. Uh -huh. I'm like, whoa, okay, I'll have to kid gloves with this one. Jeez. So they called and said that Dave Regal stole their bike. And then I wound up in his garage in like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. He just had enough time to strip it. And this is the place on Boa Street. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Boston Clover down there, at, uh, close to the uh, old Unimart. <laughs> Penn Supreme. Where was yeah. Penn Supreme at? Right there. When you leave my house, go past my garage, hook a left. Oh, by the, the cemetery way. there. Yeah, it's my road, man. Past Chuck Metz's garage on the left. Where all the yeah, old Chuck Metz. Oh, yeah. my God. And uh, yeah. that store. Dan worked there, remember? Did he? I don't remember, remember that. Dan got a job. We went in there and stole all the freaking <laughs> I don't cars. remember that at all. <laughs> but Dan <laughs> couldn't see. You know, we were <laughs> in there hanging out. He, he lasted like a week. <laughs> well, I don't remember that. Uh, Mr. Hall, we seem to have an inventory problem here. <laughs> We're not going to be able to employ you any longer. No, I don't remember that Poor at all. Man. So, yeah, so they, he went through your garage. You had the thing stripped down already. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about your bike shop at all. Yeah, sure. I was a well I was a well old machine, man. <laughs> so Dave had a bike shop in his basement. Um, so he, he was better at it than... Than that incident, so I'm not sure how he got caught because he had a a, a catalog of bikes well, in his the, basement. The daylight stunt and you know, just had to have it. Yeah, it, was, it was just had like, to have it. Yeah, yeah, that's that was what it, it was. And I wanted it so bad I could taste it. <laughs> what, like, what was it? Do you remember? Like, I'm willing to go to jail for that for that dino. <laughs> that was know? a dino. Yeah. Oh yeah, those things were really. Yeah. They, yeah. they were getting a lot of them. Yeah, and uh, I took it broad daylight, but you know, I had a friend. I'm not gonna say his name. But he stole a lot of bicycles, too. I didn't actually steal a lot of bicycles, like go out and hunt them down and, you know, sneak in the garage. I mean, we did it a time or two, but we always went to a different town. Oh, but, yeah. But he did it a lot, so I didn't feel bad stealing a bicycle that he had already stolen from somebody else because I was oh, kind of— Oh, wait, East? No, 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 oh, no. Oh, this no. guy. No, just a guy, a friend of mine, a real close friend that I'm just not wearing yeah. the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Camera. Yeah. But he stole a lot of bikes. And, well, you know. Yeah. Tip for tat, you know, he would do douchey stuff, and I would steal a bike from him. Yeah. You know, make all his hard work <laughs> diminished. And uh, he stole really good bikes, so I, I would strip the 
strip the bikes down, put all the best parts on my personal bicycle, right. which was a super goose that I had. That was a sweet bike, yeah. And um, the rest of the parts would go into this big refrigerator <laughs> box that I had in the basement. And people would ask me, hey, man, you know, I need a set of cranks. You got any cranks? And I would say, yeah, I got several cranks. You know, come on over and take a look in the in the refrigerator box. You know, we'd go down there and tip the box over. I got a part for my red line down there. Yeah. Take out some stuff. Yeah. If you I know, don't I don't have one, I'll get it for you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'll have to order it. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, that, that's kind of, I didn't have full bicycles down there. I didn't have frames down there because... There was a guy, I'd call him up, and 20 minutes later, I'd hear a whistle from down on the corner there toward toward her street. As soon as I'd hear the whistle, I'd just stick the frame out the garage door, and he would grab it on his bicycle as he drove on by. He'd be gone. He would sell that down in the city and, yeah, you know, they right. buyers, you know? Yeah. Supply yeah. and demand. Right. Yeah. Well, we had a lot but of bicycles I, disappear into the city. We used to see kids come out. They come out three, four, five at a time, right? And they're riding one or two bicycles. The rest are walking or they're, they're riding double, which we put an end to that. Cause, no, you ain't riding double. Yeah. yeah. And uh, next thing you know, 20 minutes later or an hour later, you'd see them going down Walnut Street and they're all riding a bicycle. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's pretty obvious. I, I chased <laughs> you down, down there right below the park side one night. And they went, they were up. I didn't chase them, but I, I knew where they were going. And luckily, I just happened to see where they stopped. They went up on a porch, and they were up there stripping this bicycle. I'm sitting there watching them. They had no idea it was an unmarked car. Uh. And I'm watching them take it apart, take it apart. And I, I knew they stole it because I knew where it came from. So I, I bagged them and got mom and dad, and they came out to the office. And needless to say, mom and dad were flipping a gasket. But yeah, um, we, had, we had a lot of that stuff. But you know, back in the 80s, policing is a lot different than it is today. Yeah. It was... Uh, when I started in Pembroke, it was a retirement community. Yeah. A lot of older folks, a lot of retired people. Um, believe it or not, a lot of the problems I dealt I dealt with a lot of the juvenile stuff. Yeah. And I dealt with uh, traffic safety. Those were my two things. Oh, okay. I mean, we yeah. did it all. Well, there's a lot of juveniles. I mean, there's a lot of us running around. Yeah. Know? I mean, I, it was yeah. a, lot of, like, a lot of juveniles there. I mean, there's a huge group of us kids a in there. Huge. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of kids in there. there. Yeah. And it, it was a lot of mischievous stuff. But you know, everybody says <clears> about <throat> police departments and stuff. Back then, if I had to guess, I'd say I spent no more than 5 or 10% of my time doing police work. Hmm. The rest of the time, it was, there's a bird stuck in my shingle. Yeah, right. Yeah. Garbage disposal yeah. doesn't work. Sewer in the basement. And first line of defense is the police department. Yeah. They call yeah. us for everything. Right. Because you're out there. Baby squirrels in the, in the yard. Baby squirrels. had two squirrels <laughs> over a tree out in the time we went up with a tower truck. Yeah. They had their tails knotted together, so yeah. we had to rescue them. Yeah. A hundred million dollar tower. How do you get a squirrels with their tails? Yeah, they, they were fighting. They were hanging over a branch fighting each other, and the lady called. We went up about 75 feet with the tower truck. We went up there, and my son was actually in the basket, and he uh, had to put the heavy gloves on and grabbed them and brought them down. And they, those squirrels, we have our picnic out there every year. The squirrels are still there. She cut their tails off. That's the only way we can get them on the Really? Yeah. That's, <laughs> a, that's a heck of a price for the taxpayers over a couple of squirrels to bring a tower truck out. And yeah, well, I get this true. It, it, today, yeah, you know, I know. Yeah. Four, yeah. four or five thousand dollar taxpayer cost just for some squirrels. Yeah. Come on, man. Be I know. done. What? I had Pember, be done. And, <laughs> we had a, a pigeon trapped in a wooden shingle there on Walnut Street, like right across from Bow Street, where it went up on the north side. Yeah. And the guys came down to the fire engine, and they are just ranting and raving at me. And they said, what are you calling the fire department for? It's public service. I said, just put the damn ladder up, and I'll go up and get him myself. I said, I am a fireman. I know how to climb right, the ladder. Yeah. No, Ray, we'll get him. We'll yeah. get him. I said, but what are you doing? It was cold out. You know, it was like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, rush hour. Got a fire truck sitting there with a ladder. And they freed the pigeon, and he flew off. And I said, now, don't you feel better? And they didn't, <laughs> want, the cop, they didn't <laughs> want the cop climbing the fire ladder. Yeah, right. Wasn't there always like a and they're, they're all they're grumbling. competition oh, between yeah. the fire yeah. department and the police departments? <laughs> well, actually, we, we had a really good fire department. I used to, I don't know about the other guys, but I, when they would get a fire call, especially if they were going to the township, they, they were dispatching 44 apparatus, you know, such and such, right? <laughs> well, I'd either cover 28th and Walnut or I'd cover 30th and Walnut. And get them through because I knew they were coming, you know. And uh, that was something that I just offered up as an extra just because I wanted to make sure they got through the intersections. Yeah. Oh, nice. So Parkway down there, was Parkway part of Pembroke? 
No, actually, well, it was, but actually, it's the cities. So just, I want to get back into so like some of the do you remember things, Ray? I don't know if you remember chasing us through the cemetery the one time, and you were, I did a lot of chasing <laughs> in the cemetery. <laughs> uh, Halloween, they were up there partying at right. the mausoleum, and they yeah, uh, that, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember there was like six of us um, on our BMX bikes, and you chased us down through there. And it must have been. I mean, I was thinking in my head it was the sound of that Crown Vic engine, but I don't think you had a Crown Vic. It was whatever that. That was that car. That was well, that was an LTD two there. That blew. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. We yeah. did have some Crown Vicks though. Oh, did you? Maybe yeah. it was because it, it sounded like a Crown Vic to me in my head. That's what I heard. But um, I heard that engine, you know. <laughs> and then, <laughs> but you pulled up to the hill going up by the the tunnel down there, and you basically got out and yelled, just like, "Just come back and talk to me." So you know, we all walked down the hill, and you were like, "Just, just go the hell home." <laughs> this is like three a.m. or something. So we're like, all right. So we just went home. Like, yeah, get the hell out of my yeah, stomach yeah, exactly. <laughs> You guys are making my life long. Right. You know? yeah, I, got that, I got that quick talk. Get the hell out of yeah. my cemetery more than once. Yeah, yeah. We thought we were done. Get we're like, we're going damn to- motorcycles out of my cemetery. Yeah. So we, we talked about Dave's bike shop, but uh, what about throwing snowballs at cars on her yeah, street? I remember you know? that. Oh, yeah. A lot of the times that was us. Um, and the water balloons. I didn't do the water balloons. You did the water balloons? Yeah, I, didn't, the water balloons. I didn't get any water balloons. I got snowball calls. Yeah, yeah, we did the snowballs. Because our house was right on the other. We were, I was around the uh, cemetery. Yeah, you were right there 28th yeah, Street. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 28th. Yeah. When I, so I moved there in 80, 1984. So would you have been acting chief at that point or was it before yeah, that? Yeah, probably. But you, so you were. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember an incident? This would have been like 85. It's not up there because I was debating whether I should even talk about it. But, um, some kids stole money from me. So I, we moved from Altoona down to Harrisburg. I lived with my grandmother on 13th Street on the hill for that summer. And then uh, I made friends down there with you know city city kids. But uh, so we when we moved to Edgemont, um, I uh, this kid came to my house. He ended up stealing money from me. And we saw him steal it. He tried to act like we you know he didn't we didn't see him, but we did. So we took him down to the the tunnel down in the cemetery and made him walk back the tunnel and he ended up coming out the damn street on uh her street come out of the manhole i don't know if you remember that but we were like why isn't he coming back no I don't he climbed that. out of the manhole there all we heard was sirens everywhere and we're like oh we're dead you know we're, we're going to jail for life <laughs> oh guy on that one no because the story is so john yerger i don't know if you remember him he was with us and this is what he claimed he walked over to her street and that he was sitting in the back of one of the police cars. He said it was a Pembroke car. And um, so maybe it could, could have been a part-time guy or something. But, well, yeah, he said he told the kid to, to go home or he's going to kill his family or something like that. And the kid got out and went home. <laughs> oh and we never, we never heard anything about it. So John told the kid that's that. That's what he said. John but, could be pretty convinced. Yeah, I know. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> back in the day, I drove bus for Central <laughs> Dolphin. And I was a police officer the whole time I was a bus driver. Oh, was that right? I know. Yeah, huh. and uh, I had a lot of, a lot of, intermingling there because the kids in Pembroke, I I, I would drive. In the beginning, I drove uh, like spare. Hmm. Okay, you fill in whoever whoever's not there, and then I started driving five mornings a week because I worked three days, three to eleven, and I was off Thursday and Friday. Well, they Thursday and Friday they'd give me the Pembroke runs in the afternoon if they were open hmm. because they were called the runs from hell. And really? Yeah. So the first time they gave me, you know, these kids were, were off the dial in the bus. Oh. There was four runs. Huh. So I, you know, I, I covered them. Um, and I come back, like the first day I come back, or the first Thursday and Friday, I come back and they're saying, aren't you frenzied? I said, no, why? They said, well, you just did a Pembroke run, didn't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, didn't they, didn't they act like total animals and crazy and all that stuff? I said, no. Right. Yeah. They said, you're kidding me. I said, you could hear a pin drop on that bus. I said, you thought you were in Sunday school. <laughs> oh, and they yeah. looked at me and they said, well, how'd you do that? I said, they know me. Yeah. I right. said, I told them, I said, not, Ray McGarrett's not a cop today. He's a bus driver. But when you cross the borough line, yeah. if you do something wrong, you're mine. <laughs> yeah, that's your jurisdiction. I, did, I said, that's my, you're mine. I said, <laughs> order off to you. I said, I'm, I'm in 24 hours when you cross the borough right. line. So. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, make my day, you know, like Dirty yeah. Harry. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And yeah. You could hear a pin drop on any of the, one of those four buses. Right. And it, it was funny because they they all knew me, you know. Was Central Dolphin kids were going to live in Pembroke? Well, yeah, they, that's where they go to school, Central Dolphin. We used to have yeah. Pembroke Elementary yeah, so School. Because I went to was, Susquehanna. I'm just wondering what where that line was. Well, you know where the big <clears throat> elementary school was in there, don't you? Right up over the hill from the hardware store? Back there on uh, Elm Street? 
I don't think I did. No. Well, Roberto's is down here, and then it was Dolphin Deposit Bank. No, Skipped up over the hill. You run into uh, Pembroke Elementary. That was Central Dolphin. They gave that to us for a while. We were in the office over there for like, I don't know, a year or two. We had that. Wait, were they, like by Zimmerman's Candy? Uh, yeah, right across the street. Oh, yeah, that what that is. Okay, I thought that looked like a school, but it, yeah, that's, wait, that's was that's that a your, school? Yeah, it was your Pembroke Elementary school. Uh, All the bad okay. kids went there. Yeah, and then they moved it out. They shut it down, and they gave it to the borough, and the borough put the police department over there. We had a gym. We had all kinds of things. And there for a while, for, for quite a while, while we were in there, I started a, a recreational program for the kids. Really? Because they, you know, they all complained, we don't have anything to do. We don't have anywhere to go. Yeah. And some of the people's answers were, well, it's not our responsibility to entertain you and stuff. But I, said, I went in on my own time, and I think it was at least two or three nights a week when I was off. I would run a rec program. We'd open up the gym and play volleyball, basketball. Wow, and do okay. All kinds I didn't of know you did all that stuff. Yeah. Was that, this the 80s also? Yeah, in the 80s. Huh. Yeah, we didn't even know about that. We were making our own fun. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I wanted to do something for the kids, so I, I gave that time back to them. You know, and I wasn't getting paid. I didn't care. Yeah. It was, it was, I was all about the kids, and that's what they didn't understand. They couldn't understand why Ray's so hard, but yet he's doing all this stuff, you know? Yeah. And it was like, yeah. I dearly loved them all. I just didn't want them to get in trouble. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, I don't know when community-oriented policing became a thing, but, I mean, it was obvious that that's what you were doing back then. Um, you know, you were out there on the streets, you know, t- walking around, talking to us, stopping, you know, with, like you said, with your windows down, you know, yeah. building relationships with us at that point. So it was definitely cool to see. Well, another thing we did, too, and... Uh, Dolphin County offered us <clears throat> the lead way of making, you know, with juvenile arrests, you could either submit it to Dolphin County Juvenile Probation, well, you think go through juvenile court, think. or you could handle it in the department. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of the times, cases that would have gone to Dolphin County Juvenile, I did a department probation program, which I, it was an individual thing. If I got you, I made it to fit what you did. Okay. If I got you, I made it fit what you did. Okay. And it was, they were never the same. Yeah. But I had them writing reports. I had them bringing their report oh, cards nice. to me. Yeah. They had to report once a week when they got off the bus at three o'clock and come in my office and see me. Yeah. And they had curfews. And I said, the first time I come to your house and you're not there, you'll be in after school for a month. <laughs> and I'm, I, even, I said, you never know. Thursday and Friday, I'm off. If I come through Pembroke, I'm stopping. You never know. Nice. And I did. Yeah. I, I did a couple. And boy, that, that got their attention. Everybody knew. Well, it's obvious. That's probably how I ended up with community service instead of big tons of fines and jail and probation. Oh, for the bike thing, you mean? Yeah. Oh, is that what you got, community service? Yeah, restitution, which is 45 bucks. That was on stuff that was already broke on the bike. But, uh, and... I think 80 hours of community service. I oh, didn't yeah. do. When did the accident happen? I, you know, I heard you were involved with a vehicle accident. Was it a traffic stop, or can you walk me through that? No, we, I, I was working. It was my last night in. It was Wednesday night. And Wednesday night's our slow night. So uh, one of our part-timers who worked down at the airport in uh, Capitol Police down at the airport, mm. he called me up and said, you want to run speed check tonight? And I said, oh, come on. I, I, I don't really want to do it. I said, I've already got like 35 hours overtime this pay. And I took all my overtime as comp time so I could be off with my kids. Yeah. But he wanted to run, and he said, look, I, I need some extra money. And I said, all right, come on up. So about the quarter of 11, I get a dog call. So I'm out to 11.30, putting the dog in the kennel and feeding him down there at the borough garage. Come back to the office, and Larry's ready to go. So we get down, and we set up in the 2600 block of Walnut Street, right there by Commonwealth Bank, Happy Martins. Yeah. So we got one police car sitting there with the lights going around. Then we didn't have vests, you know, like reflective vests and stuff. So the car's in the, in the right lane. I'm stretching the tapes out, and I stopped two cars. And the second car almost hit the first car because he wasn't paying attention because they stopped. Yeah. And it's pretty well lit down there. You know, we're, we're in, the, in the lighted area of Walnut Street down there, right close to Roberto's. And I turned my back. And I, I always taught the fire police. They had me teaching the fire police how to direct traffic and stuff. So um, I did against my own judgment. I turned my back on a motors, and I called them the Maniac Motors because you never turn your back on one. They'll do anything they can to keep going. Yeah. The car takes off, hits me from behind. I go up over his hood, broke his windshield, flew off in midair, and I got hit by a car going the other way in midair, about 25 miles an hour. And then the second guy was a doctor, and he was DUI yet. You're kidding me. So it it turned into a real nightmare. Um, I hear Larry over there on the side because he watched watched it from the curb where he was sitting in there holding the tapes. We're going to put the tapes out. And he's screaming bloody murder, something about officer down and... I, I didn't know what happened. I got up and I looked around and I saw this big circle of blood 
And I'm like, whoa, I wonder what that is. And I went like this because my head hurt. And I had blood all over oh. my hands. And then I laid down in the middle of the road. I, I couldn't, my, apparently I crushed a vertebrae in my back and didn't know it. And uh, I was laying there in the yellow line. And next thing you know, here comes the cavalry, man. They had like four from Susquehanna, four from Sweat Era, four from the city, Pax Tang. Um, Lower Paxton sent three or four, you know. Yeah. And uh, I have the tape of it at home. They gave me the tape. Really? What yeah. did the dispatch call? Yeah, I, I listened to it, and they, they were, they're going along, and all of a sudden you hear this, uh, 1291 County, 1291 County, officer down, 2600 block of Wall Street. Hmm. I still get emotional about this. Um, next thing the county goes, they, they cleared the channel, and they gave the alert to us. They said, county to all cars. Officer down 2,600 block of Walnut. Wow. Wow. And you hear like 31, 33, you know, Susquehanna. Yeah. Yeah. Even the detectives came. Yeah. But they, uh, it was funny because, you know, I was all big into medical stuff because I was running with the ambulance, right? So I'd always go on ambulance calls. Yeah. And I'd do their assessments and have everything ready for them when they got there, you know, because I'm, I'm already out, right? Yeah. So Medic 5 out of Poly gave me a whole med kit and oxygen cylinder and everything to keep in my car because I was doing so much for him. Oh, really? When they came down. Yeah, I thought that was pretty. Jim DeHaven uh -huh. was head of uh, Medic 5 up there. But they came that night for me. So they're, they're checking wow. me out. I'm laying there in the street and they're going to cut my vest off. I said, don't cut my vest off. It's Velcroed. I said, that vest costs $1,000. Yeah. You know, I don't want the bro to have to be out. And the vest, <coughs> believe it or not, saved my whole upper body. I didn't have one really? broken rib, one bruise, nothing. Wow. And they went for a save through Smith & Wesson, but they didn't give it to them. Didn't they really? But, uh, I mean, they're sitting there, and they said, Ray, do you mind flying? And I looked at them, and I said, don't you think I flew enough today? <laughs> and they started <laughs> yeah. laughing, and they said, oh, wow. they said we're going to lifeline you. Well, then panic set in. I'm taking inventory. I'm counting fingers, yeah. toes. You know, yeah. I said, you don't go riding the lion yeah. and, yeah, unless something's going on. Was it because of the head injury? I get, I don't know. I mean, my head was split open. I had 67 stitches about that wide down my skull, knocked my front teeth out, uh, broke my tib fib on my left leg. And uh, I had a lot of road rash and stuff, you know, but um, they, then they got me loaded. They loaded me in the ambulance. They said, Ray, we're not going to fly you. Um, we got you packaged up. You weren't under the car. So we're going to take you by ground. So there was, the boat driver stopped. No, the first guy kept going and they got him. Okay. And then the second guy stopped. He was DUI. State police handled it. They had two rookies handle it, which we would have never done that to them. But yeah. Um, yeah. They didn't field sobriety test him. He got out of the DUI. Mm. And uh, he was a doctor. But uh, it was it was quite an ordeal. I was off work 16 months. Jeez. I went through a lot of uh, therapy and stuff. When I went to the orthopedic surgeon about my back, they said, we're not going to operate on your back, but it's going to be about a year. And I, I was I was telling the guys, I'm going to be back to work in two weeks, you know? Yeah. And I came off the table with this guy in crutches and a leg brace and everything else. I, I was going to try and hand him his head. I said, you're not keeping me off work for a year. Yeah. And it wound up being 16 months, and uh, I did go back. Did you really? Yeah, so what year back. was that? Uh, it was July or June 19th, 1991. Oh, 91. And okay. the bad thing about that was on Sunday, we were leaving for the shore. Yeah, jeez. I was off Thursday and Friday. I took Saturday off, and we were going to leave for the shore Sunday. We never made vacation that summer. Jeez. I went, I went home the next day. They wanted me to keep me a week, and I said no. Yeah. And I went home the next day, and my kids thought, I mean, my head was shaved here, and it was all stitches and all blood and everything. And my kids thought they saw Frankenstein. Wow. So wow. how... So how long after that then? I mean, how long did you stay in the policing? Um, did you make it another? I guess, I don't know how long was that, 10 years, I guess. Another 10 years then you did after that. And then I came up and I went back to Central Dolphin full-time driving bus. Oh, really? Oh, that, that's an incredible story, though. So, yeah, yeah. Hit by two cars. Yep. And that was on Walnut Street there, yeah. on the main street. Both of them were about 25 miles an hour. Jeez. And I said, well, that's, that's probably the only, well, the only other time I got hurt, I chased Jimmy Clark back. They had closed hallways between the houses there on uh, Bruiser Avenue. Mm -hmm. And it was like a house, house. And it was like just a hallway between the houses. It was all closed in. And they were doing something. I'd jump out of the car and chase them back through. I tripped over a ladder and tackled them. Oh, geez. And when I did, I sprained my ankle. <laughs> and I'm laying on top of him, and, I'm, and he's going, you okay? I said, 
Yeah, I said, just get out of here. Just go <laughs> and I, I crawled back through the hallway Are into the police serious, car. Really? Yeah. Oh, and I, I was off work like a month because I, <laughs> I messed up the ligaments in my ankle. Right. That was right when I first started. That was like December of, of the year that I started. Yeah. And uh, January, I was supposed to leave with the uh, fraternity, Theta Chi. Oh. We were supposed to go to London. Oh. And they said, Ray, you can't go to London on crutches. I said, what do you mean I can't go to London on crutches? I said, put a skateboard under it or something. And they said, you can't go. I actually met my ex-wife in Pembroke. She oh. lived there right where I got run over Oh, in an apartment. And uh, I had a couple of different calls with her. Uh, some girl was harassing her and coming there and causing problems. And um, one thing led to another. And we started going out. Next thing you know, we, about a year later, we got married. You know, and, Really? Yeah. What year was that? Um, 1985. Okay. So you weren't married when, in 84, no, when I moved there and you were chasing us around. You no, I was single. Single. Yeah. <clears throat> but you end up meeting some, a Pembroke girl. Yeah, she lived there in Pembroke and her, her grandmother, in fact, her grandmother, they lived on the second floor above, Col, right above Colhane's Market there. Oh, yeah, yeah. And grandma used to watch us run speed enforcement at nighttime because she was in the, she'd sit there in the window at night. Yeah. She was a night out. She watched me get run over. Oh, oh, she saw it happen. Yeah, she saw it happen. Oh, jeez. And you were already seeing each other at that point? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. So how long were you she married to her? Uh, we got divorced in 95. Okay. Well, it didn't last too long. 12, it was 12, well, no, wait, 97, 12 years. Okay. So and you, she's one of my best friends today, believe it or oh, not. Oh, is that right, really? Yeah, we're very, very good friends. And we have two wonderful children, and I have four grandchildren. Oh, wow. I was going to ask her if she was a mother of your children. Yeah. My youngest is a Baltimore County fireman and uh, actually a captain now. Yeah, that's and crazy. My captain daughter's of Baltimore a County. teacher over at Cumberland Valley. Oh, wow. Okay. She used to be at Susquehanna. Really? Uh, yeah. And huh. uh, I, I can't say, you're going to have to stop me on my kid because, both my kids, but my son, I get that get to get out and ride with him. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was one of the, the greatest experiences. I do it like twice a year. That I is cool. I see those yeah. pictures you post on Facebook when you get to do that. And see oh, how man. I, you're uh, it's incredible. It's such a rush to run with a paid department. So is that, that's a Pembroke car? That was the first Pembroke car. That was a 79 LTD2. Paxtang had one one number away on the serial number. On oh, the really? Number. Yeah. And there's burned up, went up in flames. We were over at a and one night at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Watched it take off. Oh, jeez. That had a 460 in it? Nah, 351. It was a Windsor. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that. Cleveland's were early 70s. So does that have a cage in it? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. Ray, were you involved in fighting the TRW fire? I was working that night in Pembroke. I took actually took Mayor for Lizzie, out for Lizzie, down, and we sat there on the hill there on uh, her street and watched it. I climbed out on the roof of my house at Bows and Clover and watched it from there. Huh. Yeah, no, I was, was working in Pembroke. It was the biggest mm. thing I ever saw on fire. Yeah, oh. that was crazy. Um, so what is that other car? That's a Dodge Aspen, and then the ones with the Chrysler LeBaron that I have. Okay. Oh, the Baron. I was thinking Diplomat. Yeah, that's a LeBaron. You guys have fancy Chrysler's. What, yo, yeah, what, what year do you think that is? A 81. Oh, okay. That's an 81 LeBaron. But the, the cars I liked best were the Crown Vicks. Yeah. And, uh, we had some yeah. Chevy uh, Impalas. That's probably the car I first saw you in. And they were like, that's the I just, I just love those light bars. I used to take them off every Sunday morning and polish the lens. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 And that, that light on the top. You could spot airplanes. You could, I could search the whole park area down nice. there by the pool. Just ride down Bow Street. And we had spot and flood. And it, it was oh, like a that football is field. really it was, nice. It, it was incredible. Um, so where was that picture taken? you remember? Pa um, that's not the parkway because it's McAdam. I don't know where that is. Do you remember Dead Man's Curve in Pembroke? Why they called it that? Is it down there to turn around? In the middle, about in the center. Middle of the parkway, yeah. It was, uh, from what I heard, it was Gary Straw riding a motorcycle and Shane Berger is on the back. Mm. And they crashed going around that corner. Mm. Somewhere, somehow or another, there's no seal on that door, and I don't know why. Oh, yeah. But we had we had the white Pembroke police patch on that door. Is their patch and the same now? Do they have the same patch now? I th think they went to another one. Oh, okay. It's a blue one now. We the, see the white patch up on my yeah. sleeve up there? there there's yeah. one on each I one. I remember the old school one, yeah. Shane Berger, I, I got to mention him. He's one of the Pembroke kids that recently passed That's away. That's right, yeah. Shane passed. Yeah. 
There's a there's one of my favorites things to do. Yeah, that's a nice truck too. I don't like driving those. That's the new one from KME. The the old one was uh, a 2001. I just dearly loved that engine. Never drove anything like that at pump water. Like no, there was no business. So th <coughs> this was when you were acting acting chief. Yeah, you can see the gold there. Oh yeah, my yeah, mom yeah, insisted right. that I get my picture taken. That's so great. Yeah, I made her happy, and I did that. Oh, look at that look, man. That's that look you hate to get. Yeah. The oh, two yeah. guys that I was over, that got put over, you yeah. know, we're, we're all really good friends. Are you, really? You still uh, talk? There was no... I talked to Bill about four or five times a week. And what I was Bill's to name? I'm Schweiler. Well, who was... So who else was there? So I got I got picked up for... So you gave me a warning at night for curfew, but somebody else picked me up for curfew. And uh, he didn't cite us or anything. He took me back. It was worse back then. He took me back to the station and called my dad. And my dad came in with that pissed off look on his face, but... So I don't know who that was though. Who Might else? Have been Heaster, because Dave worked a lot of all the midnight. Oh, and okay. Mikey Reynolds was was daylight, and then Bill Imschwaller. Mikey went to midnight for a while. It might have been Mike Reynolds because Mike, when Bill took over as uh, no, when Bill took over as chief, Mike went to midnight. Mike loved midnight shift, and I I just yeah. you know I did it when I started, and then I got to where I was with. That, I, I like being on Thursday and Friday. I could go do my Christmas shopping while everybody's working. Yeah. Speaking of speed traps, how, how did Gulick come along to Pembroke? Mike came in, uh, got a job, and he was in his first year. And Mike was very, very gung ho. <laughs> that's why. That's why I raised the question with the speed traps because where on the street was he wrote more speeding tickets than the whole entire history of Pembroke. Oh. Who, Gulick? Yeah. No. No, you did? Yeah. <laughs> I went to, went to a Don Smith traffic safety class. Don so, Smith. Oh, man. Such he, Township. He hated me. He was, he was the guru. He helped write the vehicle. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and he was a young guy. You know, Don just passed away here a couple of years ago from uh, cancer. Oh, wow. But he was a one. I went to every one of his classes, accident reconstruction, accident uh, investigation, any any uh, vehicle code classes he had up at ACT. So when they were sitting in class up there, and Don, when he when he wanted to be funny, he would whine. You know, he'd say he come in and said, "Hi, I'm Don Smith. I'm from Susquehanna Township Police Department." Da 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 da. And he goes, "Okay." He's, so he's looking around the room. He goes, "What would you guys say <laughs> if I told you there's an officer sitting in this room that writes 1,100 citations a year on the average?" And these guys are all like, "There's 30 guys in this class from all over." Yeah. And they're like, "Who in the hell is that?" Right. Don's looking around and he smiles and he looks at me and I'm like, don't you dare. He goes, <laughs> Officer McGarrow, he says, would you know anything about that? And I said, why don't you just throw me under the bus, Don? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He said, this man wow. writes 1,100 citations a year. Wow. There's nine, guys citations. In his, there's nine guys in his department that write 1,600 total. 1,100 of them are his. <laughs> Wow. wow! See, I heard that about Gulick. You know, yeah. but, yeah. He, he was my only competition. Him. Probably because he was so gung ho. Man. Well, he was my only competition. I mean, I I wrote more tickets, more traffic citations, more non-traffic citations, more miles on the car. Yeah. More call. You know, I just right. I was like always out there doing stuff. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then when Gulick came, it was like, man, this guy's gonna give me a run for my money. <laughs> <laughs> and People and he so and he did you know what yeah. Mike there was this nights I'd come in on Saturday morning he's working Friday night midnight he had three or four DUI arrests in one night oh wow and we didn't have a bar in Pembroke it's dry yeah we didn't yeah. Have, and I mean he got more he got more DUIs than me and I'm like you're killing me they're coming from the Broadway Cafe yeah right Jazzland. yeah yeah Jazzland, yeah <laughs> Um, did you guys have central booking there? Yeah, we went down to, well, there for a while we were doing our own processing. So oh, okay. we did fingerprints, we did photographs, um, we did the arrest report. I, me, as a juvenile officer, I, I got to do a lot of juvenile allegations and actually went to court. And when I went to other departments and seen them arrest juveniles, they had to get their CI guys to come in and do it. They didn't know how to do it. Wow. So yeah. we got a much better education being yeah. one man for shift because we had to do it all. Oh, we did. Interesting. So was your central booking still at the uh, out by the East Mall there at the well, prison? No, I guess no, no, no. Back then it was down at City Hall. Oh, okay. I remember one time we had a we had a big snowstorm. All the police cars they all broke chains and wrapped around the axles. So they asked me if I wanted to ride my snowmobile one night. Uh, where in Pembroke? Yeah, in Pembroke yeah. on duty. It was I've got a foot of snow, uh, so I rode the snowmobile the whole three to eleven shift. Really? Yeah, I had a cord bike stuffed up in my helmet, and I get over there to Franklin Street off of Bose. 
and there's a bunch of kids sled riding them, the Nichols and um, Kirshners and all of them. They were all up there sled riding. And I pull up and they're going, wow, look at that snowmobile. You know, shut it off, took my helmet off. And they go, oh, it's McGarrow. <laughs> yeah, right. I said, hey, what's up? I said, who's beer? Yeah. And they all looked at me like, what? I said, whose beer is that? They had like two cases of Rolling Rocks in there. Yeah. And they said, I said, how many people are 21? And everybody looked around like, no. Right, yeah. I said, imagine that. I said, uh, so you're going to take our beer, you're going to take it and drink it. I said, I don't drink beer. I said, so here's what we're going to do. I said, I can't take it back. I don't really want to take it back to the office on my snowmobile. I don't want you to think that I'm going to drink it because I don't drink beer. I said, so to prove to you that I'm not going to drink it, open all the bottles and dump them. <laughs> oh, come on, Ray, that was two weeks allowance for each of us. Yeah. Dump it, or yeah. everybody gets arrested. Right. They're standing out there, tears are running down their face, <laughs> dumping this, this beer down, you know. What hill was that where they were sledding? Right there, it was on Franklin Street over there. It was, uh, if you go down, up around from Kinderman's on Bose, the first street to the left was State, went down to the bus garage down there at the yeah. end. Yeah. And then Foster Street ran below there. This was in Pembroke, not the one in the city. Right. Yeah. If you went out Bow Street further, the next street to the left was Franklin. It's a big hill that went down over to Foster Street. Yeah, I don't Foster think I street. knew about that hill. Did Pembroke ever have a canine? No, and I wanted one. And I had I had somebody donating a canine. And it was Jim Baldosser from the body shop down there, yeah. 25th and her. Oh, he was going to pay for the dog, the, the blazer. Oh, wow. That's and equip the blazer. And the only thing they had to do was pay for my training in Pembroke. And then uh, they wouldn't allow me to do it because they said we have canines in Susquehanna, we have canines oh, in the city, yeah. Yeah. and we're not going to do that. So, and yeah. I was broken hard because I had everything set up to do it, and I, w I wanted a dog so bad. There's no better partner than a canine. Yeah. Frank Dushek had one. He was a corporal, and when I was working until 3 in the morning, we were splitting that midnight shift. So I was 3 to 3. About midnight, they, got, they called Frank, who was a corporal for the shift, and they said, over in Latchmere, we've got skinny dippers in the pool. Yeah. So everybody is headed that way, right? I'm, I'm right across the street there in Pembroke. And Frank comes down out of Interstate Drive, and it's just misting. It's summertime, right? He slides on the white road, hits the curb, yeah. and takes the A-frame out of the car. Uh -huh. So he calls in and says, I've been involved in an accident. Get, tell Tom Bell to come out the chief, you know? And he said, Can send Pembroke out here. So I went out to cover up town in case they got a call. So, and this is really funny to me because Frank was always in doing stuff and he was a great guy. But Tom comes driving in and he comes walking up the driveway and he's looking at the car and looks at the, underneath the car and he looks at Frank and he looks at me. And he goes, you know, Ray, he said, I can teach him how to write a report. I can teach him how to do different things. He said, but I can't teach him common sense. <laughs> he, said, and he said, tell me how this happened, Frank. He said, no, let me tell you how this happened. You heard about the skinny dippers at the pool. <laughs> and you were going to fly over there and see yeah. what was going on, right? right. And he said, yeah. he came down out of here too fast and lost it and hit the curb. He said, yeah. wrecked my car. He said, Frank, when you come to work tomorrow, he said, the dog's driving the car and you're in the back. <laughs> and he got in his car and he left. And I, uh, I, I probably didn't stop laughing yeah. for two days. <laughs> That's funny. 20, you said 25 years. Yeah. You did 25 years in, in law enforcement. What? Would you do it again? Oh, I would in a heartbeat. Yeah. It was the best job I ever had. Uh, being a police officer, every day is different. Yeah. I mean, some of the players are the same. You get some of the same family domestics. You know, we had some regulars, you know, a couple people that we go to. And some of my uh, go to people, when something went wrong, I know where to go look. <laughs> you know, they were the same, but every day is different. Every call is different. Yeah. Probably the, the worst thing that happened was they left some clown. Excuse me. Some person from PennDOT redo the accident reports, and they've they've created such a nightmare in trying to complete a Pennsylvania accident report. That was my pet peeve. I didn't like doing them. Yeah. But you know, when you get out there in your one man shift and you have snow and and rush hour travel, you get five, six, seven accidents. Now you're in the office half the night. Exactly. Doing reports. Yeah. You know. Would you get back into it now? Would I? Yeah. <clears throat> In a minute. Would you still? Yes, I would. Okay. And I, we've talked about this amongst the guys that we go to dinner with, you know, and they said it's so different now, and it's so much harder now. Back then, you had to be a jack of 97 trades. Today, the biggest trade that you need to be a part of is a lawyer. Yeah. Because yeah. everybody's watching, everybody's filming, everybody's making up stories. Yeah. And uh, you know, they, they want to, like when all that stuff went down, 
out, what is it, Chicago and all that, when they wanted to get rid of the police officer. Minneapolis. During, yeah, all like yeah. craziness. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not the same as what it was. And then it was, a, like you said, community policing, and you did a lot of different things. Uh, it was the best job I've ever had. Mm. It was absolutely incredible. I don't regret one minute of it. And when you do all three sides of the public service triangle, uh, it's more difficult than one. Yeah. But to me, it was fun. Yeah. I mean, I, I had the, the time of my life at Progress. I had the time of my life at Susquehanna Township Ambulance. I had my time of my life in Pembroke Police Department. And now I'm at Leonstown, and uh, I had 15 years there. And well, actually, I'm lying to you. I have 20, 20, 23 years there. Really? And my son was there with me for eight years. That was probably the most rewarding part of public service that I've ever had other than being a police officer was being able to run with him for eight or yeah. nine years. Yeah, nice. It was absolutely, and we did fire and ambulance, so yeah. we did two sides of it. Jeez. Um, I thought he might go police, but when he got into that junior program in Pembroke is where he started, yeah. and he came to me at Lingelstown, he just absolutely loved it. And to this day, I uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of him. Yeah. He just does yeah. a tremendous job. Everybody loves him in Baltimore. He's, he's the kind of guy that everybody wants to work for. And we had that talk one time. I said, don't forget where you came from. Yeah. Right. And he doesn't, you know. Yeah. Um, he, he's an incredible young man. and uh, That's awesome. Not because he's mine, just, but just because he's right. he is. Yeah, yeah. To be able to do this and, and just reflect back yeah. is, an, is yeah. an awesome thing for me. And it kind of brings tears to my eyes because I, I miss that. Yeah. I really want to. I would love to go back. Yeah, Aww. same here. I mean, I mean people ask me if I want to go back to high school, and everybody says no. I said, give me my four. Yeah. I will go back and do Great. it again. Yeah, yeah, this has been a very emotional process for me over the past few weeks. Yeah. And then I spoke to you. I called the Nyharts. I talked to the Yergers. I talked to uh, a whole bunch of people from Pembroke. And I still have some people on my radar I want to call. And in the process of all that, I got to thinking about who who we know yeah. that died and how they died and looking at my own life and just going back to childhood, the years, you know, the wonder years. It's, it's so hard to to look at all that and then know that you got to come back yeah. to well, reality, you know, because you kind of yeah. want to stay there. And uh, yeah. one of the first things you said on camera here today was, well, you didn't say it verbatim, but you said it takes a village. You were talking about how all the neighborhood six or whatever. Um, you know, it did take a village, and, and you don't see a lot of that anymore, you know. And public service, that's part of public service, you know. There's so much there's so much that used to happen that doesn't happen now. Things are so different. So, you know, the process of talking to all the kids from back then, which are, you know, half of them aren't even alive anymore. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I got started in emotional. this with... Uh, emergency in Adam 12 growing up right. you know, the, the kid had, you know at the window and uh, it actually took me into this when I was in high school they used to come and pick me up for ambulance calls because I was one of the few that were 16 was an EMT Jeez, that's and crazy. we were we yeah. were short people so they'd call a school and JT Duke or somebody would roll in with the ambulance pick me up and bring me back to school <laughs> and then when I hit 18 I was in the fire company you know and uh, the, like I said it was, it was a very rewarding um time sometimes i say if my mind could only forget what my eyes have seen because i've seen so much good and so much bad yeah and yeah. pretty much just about everything <laughs> i had buddy stoner from pembroke you know when he hung himself and uh it's been i mean a lot of good up and down and in and out but i wouldn't trade it for the world yeah well i mean you know we're you know, what is this you know we're, we're in our 50s now so it's 37 years later and you made an impact in our lives with you know your method of policing back then so you know we want to thank you for you know, everything you did back then so you know the, the fact that you gave us you know that chance by you know talking to us trying to talk sense into us you know and and um not going straight to just you know charges to you know just to get it done and over with was uh you know we definitely appreciate it well when we learned in the academy you know that uh, about law enforcement and discretion is a big part of that yeah and <clears throat> They used to tell me, one of my friends used to accuse me of being such a, a hard ass and such a uh, traffic guru. You know, when we run speed check details, you're out there slamming everybody. And, I, and and most people don't know this. If I stop somebody 
And I looked in their car, and they had four kids. Yeah. And they were not of the... One has stuff running out of his nose, and they were they were dressed mediocre and stuff. You know, it wasn't worth a traffic citation to me to write them and take food out of somebody's mouth. Yeah. So as much as I hate to say this, I gave her a warning. Yeah. You know, and that's part of discretion. Maybe it's not fair, but in reality, to me, it was because I, I wasn't out there for quotas. We never had a quota. Yeah, right. And you know, people ask you about that, and our, our chief, and when I was chief, no. Yeah. If I wrote one citation on a detail, or I wrote 30 or 40 on a detail, it was just, that's the way it was. Right. You know, whatever yeah. way it just fell. Yeah. And we yeah. tried to be fair about it, you know. Um, we had a guy, I got to tell you this, we had a guy, we were doing July 4th. We decided we we're going to run speed check detail at 6 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, it's, oh. it's just holiday traffic, right? <laughs> yeah. So Wednesday. So we just, for giggles, we told Chief we were going to run speed check. So about 6.30, I stopped this guy. And he is flipping out on me because I stopped him. Yeah. And he says, it's un-American. It, it, this is July 4th. I said, well, <laughs> what's un-American about it? He said, it's a holiday. I said, well, I didn't read anywhere in the rule book where it said you can speed on right. holidays. Yeah. I said, you've got a lot of people out here, you know, uh, going for, for down the river for Capona and stuff or whatever. And I said, you know, 25 miles an hour of the speed limit is ridiculous. 50 to 25 is, is pretty. Yeah. yeah. And, he, oh, he, and then he was going to crumble up the citation. And he went like this. I said, I, don't throw it on the ground. Mm-hmm. So you get another one for littering. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you may as well pour gasoline on him and lit it because he, he just ignited. Have you ever yeah. done the night stick on the head for the stop, running the stop sign thing? You ever heard that? What the hell is that? Well, there's nobody around, so I just blew through it. And the cop's like, okay, do you want me to stop knocking your head? What? Or do you want me to hear? <laughs> this happened to you? No, nah, no. Oh, what the the guy got pulled over for running the stop sign. Uh, I never heard of that. Cop pulls his night stick out and starts standing. The I guy think- says, well, there was nobody around. That's know, like, like Georgia. Right That's Georgia That's back like, roads. Do you want me to stop only when somebody comes around, or do you want me to stop? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know about that one. You, I forget how. I've, I've ruined the joke. <laughs> I don't know. You guys might enjoy this. I, I had a, one day we were running a speed detail in the morning. It was a nice day out.